Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of our three trauma-informed arts education webinars. I am Jackie Russell, Artistic Director and Co-Founder of Chicago Children's Theater. Since 2005, Chicago Children's Theater has been Chicago's premier professional children's theater dedicated to creating inclusive and diverse theatrical productions and education programs, while inspiring young people to lead lives of adventure, courage, and curiosity. We opened our first ever permanent home in the West Loop in 2017 in a former police station. We are also a national leader in developing new plays and we are known for reflecting Chicago's diversity in our work. We serve thousands of Chicago ch school children with in-school theater residencies and weekday morning matinees. We also offer a full slate of theater arts classes and camps year round and programs specifically designed for young people on the autism spectrum. All of these are now online, of course. Today, I would like to thank our webinar producer, Jamie Abelson, our partners at the Lurie Children's Center for Childhood Resilience, and the Illinois Humanities for their generous support for these webinars. Today's webinar, entitled Addressing Trauma and Fostering Resilience in the Classroom, is moderated by J.C. Abelotis. JC is a program officer at Polk Brothers Foundation, guiding grant making in the foundation's arts access and learning program. Prior to Polk Brothers, JC was director of development at Marwin, a Chicago visual arts education nonprofit. He has more than 10 years of experience as a teaching artist and is active in Chicago's live performance communities as a writer, performer, director, and administrator. Now I turn it over to you, JC. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, such a privilege to get to be here with you all. Thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, thanks to uh, Jackie and Jamie and the team at Chicago Children's Theater, to our colleagues at Illinois Humanities, and thank you, of course, to our incredible panelists from the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital. I will now briefly introduce each of them now. Dr. Colleen Cicchetti is an associate professor at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and the executive director of the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital, where she has worked as a clinical psychologist for nearly three decades. Uh, we also have Dr. Karen Gauss, um, who is a psychologist at the Center for Childhood Resilience and a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She has been with Lurie Children's Hospital for 30 years, where she served previously as the training director in psychology. And rounding out our panel is Carmen Holly, who is a social worker at the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's. Mrs. Holly is a tier two training coordinator uh, and has over 10 years of experience providing trauma-informed intervention and mental health supports to children and adolescents. I'll talk just briefly about the format of this afternoon's conversation. Uh, first, we'll have short presentations from each of our panelists. Uh, it is an impressive bunch. We're really grateful to have um, such remarkable practitioners and leaders uh, and educators uh, guiding us through this conversation. After that, we'll have a question and answer session. So as we move into this conversation together, I'm struck by how the topics of trauma and resilience are only growing more and more relevant. Jackie first shared this idea with me over coffee near the end of 2019. Uh, in the before times, when you could actually meet actual people in actual places and drink coffee and talk. And then it felt like a timely and important conversation to talk about trauma and resilience and how educators and teaching artists can adapt their practices to help foster resilience in children. Little did we all know how much 2020 would make this conversation even more urgent and relevant. While the format for these conversations is very different than what we had hoped, the need for the conversations has only grown more acute. Even before the pandemics of 2020, COVID-19, racism, economic disaster acutely targeting the most vulnerable, we knew that childhood trauma was widespread, disproportionately impacting black and brown children, and very often unaddressed. Carmen shared some statistics with me to help frame all this. Studies estimate that between 25 and 50% of children between the ages of two and five experience one or more potentially traumatic events. Community level risk factors like community violence, poverty, historical and intergenerational traumas can exacerbate this trauma and cause it even more. And these risk factors dispropor disproportionately impact communities of color with long-term impacts on their physical and mental health Studies estimate that up to 75% of children in communities marked by these risk factors experience childhood trauma. This was all true before COVID-19. 
that there was tremendous unmet need before this incredibly difficult year. And we know that the devastation of COVID-19 is not equally distributed, but is falling hardest on our most vulnerable. And COVID-19 is not only causing more and new trauma in these communities, but also cutting children off from the place that is often a critical source of healthcare for them, school. When I first joined philanthropy five years ago, conversations about trauma and its long-term impacts on children and learning were already well underway. But in my time in conversation with educators and arts organizations and practitioners, I've started to see some shifts in the conversation. From talking about classroom management as if young people are problems to be managed, to talking about manifestations of trauma and being intentional about our classroom environments, and increasing awareness of racism in our institutions and in each of us, and how that racism interacts with and exacerbates trauma, a growing knowledge that many of the tools that can mitigate the impacts of trauma and foster resilience are tools that arts educators use all the time. And that even if we never know the specific histories of young people in our classrooms, the practices of trauma-informed instruction are good for all kids and can help build more responsive and inclusive educational spaces that serve everyone better. So thank you all for joining us for this critically important conversation. However you come to us, we're glad that you're here. And now we'll turn things over to Karen to begin the presentation. I believe Colleen is going yes. to begin the presentation. Yep. My apologies, my apologies. That's okay. We, we did a quick switch on you, JC. Sorry about that. Um, so I am very excited to be here and to um, be able to have this conversation with all of you. As JC said, this is a topic that has been um, growing an interest across our country for some time, and we are certainly very grateful to be here with all of you to talk about this. Um, the team that I represent, the Center for Childhood Resilience, is really um, uh, kind of a unique program in that we sit in our Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, but we really are interested in a public health approach to children's mental health. So what we really are is a diverse team of professionals. You have a couple of us here with us today. And what we do is we try to function as an intermediary saying, what are the best practices to help kids that have been impacted by um, trauma and mental health issues? And how do we not wait for those kids to come to the hospital to get treatment, but instead go out into those places where kids live, learn and play and build a set of adults that can address kids' mental health needs by both providing opportunities for growth and wellness and also linking kids to needed services when they need more. So our goal is really to build the workforce that can try to promote thriving children in our communities. Next slide, please. So as we just heard, the need is really pretty astounding. What we think is that about seven and a half million US children have unmet mental health needs. And we think that about one out of four who ever need mental health services actually get them. And the most shocking thing of all, I think for many people is that about 75% of kids who ever talk to a mental health professional do it in schools. So schools are in fact where most kids get their mental health services. And as you know, schools are not designed to deliver mental health services, but we have to be thinking about what is it that we're gonna to need to invest in in order to make that need possible to be addressed as well as how do we link kids to those services outside of schools whenever possible. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do is just start with some definitions. What we're finding is as a person who's been a lifelong child trauma advocate, I wanted people to understand what it was. And now we're getting to a point where people are throwing around the word trauma all the time. And so what we wanna do is give you the definition that we agree with and try to promote as well as what SAMHSA is saying. And the idea is that there is an event, there's, but that event is not a bad hair day. That event is not traffic. That event is an emotionally painful or distressing event that the individual experiences in, in an intense fashion. And the really important thing for you all and us working with children is that how one experiences that event may be very different depending on the age of the child and what they've been through before and whether they blame themselves for what happened, whether they were close to it or far away. And that is why uh, in a family, for example, you might have two children that both experience child abuse but have very different trauma symptoms. And so what we look for in addition to the event and that experience that is intense and prolonged in a stress response is that it goes on for more than you know, about two months. So normally if you've had a stressful experience or even a loss, you have a period of time where you're not yourself. But what we expect is that over time, those symptoms will decrease. But when we're talking about trauma and the kind of trauma that can really impact children's functioning, what we're talking about is a trauma that that 
tends to start impacting their functioning, not just in the immediate event, so not just that they won't go to a park where they saw a shooting, but they actually start to believe that the world is a dangerous place, they can't go anywhere, that adults won't keep them safe. It changes their worldview and their view of themselves. And that can be something that happens once, but most of the time in many of our communities, what we see is that complex trauma or something that's chronic. There's no beginning, middle or end, it just keeps going. And that's what we're often facing when we're dealing with children in our classrooms. Next slide, please. I think that JC already hit on a lot of this, which is that there's a high impact. There's a lot of kids exposed, even young children, which is part of our focus today. Kids as young as five years old, about 50% of them have had some severe stressor. In our protective service team at the hospital, we see more kids under five than any other age. They are in their homes where things can happen that are dangerous. So we know that that's important. And we also know, as he said, that it's high, in high poverty neighborhoods have higher rates of exposure. But I think two things that are really critical about this slide, one is that by the time a kid gets to a specialist and someone who's been trained by a, a trauma specialist, they've often had four or more different types of trauma in their life. In addition, we've known for about 20 years that not only does trauma affect kids' mental health, but it affects the very things that schools are evaluated on. So think about things like days of absence and suspension rates and graduation rates. All of those are things that are directly tied to trauma. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to remember that trauma is an important part of this equation, but we are the Center for Childhood Resilience and there's a reason for that. We believe that trauma is something that is serious and we need to address and that we need to think about how to be much more um, aggressive about that. But we also believe that there are many things within kids and within families and communities that help to promote resilience and strength. Resilience is not something that you're born with. It's not a state trait that you either have or you don't have. It's more like a muscle. And the way we help kids be resilient is to provide them with those strong relationships, to build those positive experiences and to support their internal skills so that they can start to believe that they have an impact on the world and that they can handle situations that come their way, even ones that can be really difficult and challenging. Next slide, please. I'm going to buzz through something really quick called the ACEs study. If you're not familiar with this, I would recommend you go take a look if you're interested in learning more about trauma. But there's a couple of key takeaways from this study. First of all, this was the study that was done initially with adults, about 18,000 of them, all middle class who had insurance. And what they did is they retrospectively asked adults whether or not any of the things on this list had happened to them before they turned 18. And it was super simple, yes, no answer. And what they found is that it was much more prevalent they expect than they expected, even in a middle-class sample. Next slide, please. What they found was actually at least 26% had had one ACE, and there's many people had had two, and then there were some that had as many as four. So 60% had at least one in that middle-class sample. What we know is that that sample has been repl re replicated multiple times, and two critical things were learned. One is that ACEs occur together, which makes sense. If you were in a home where there was substance abuse, the likelihood that that could also result in other kinds of issues and child abuse and neglect, or maybe a parent being incarcerated, all of those things come together. But the most important thing about the ACEs study is that they found that it was incredibly, incredibly predictive of adult outcomes. Next slide, please. I think most of us would guess that if you've had an experience of trauma, that it wouldn't be surprising that you would have mental health issues. If your family had been experiencing those kinds of challenges, you would be expected to be anxious or depressed. What we find is that the risks are much greater than that. Jamie, can you click it? Yeah, it's really intense. So not only are you more likely to be depressed, but if you have an ACE score over four, you're 10 times as likely to be an intravenous drug user or 12 times as likely to commit suicide. So the rates are really significant. But the more significant impact is what comes next. Can you click it for me? That is that your risk for health outcomes is actually doubled. So having exposure before the age of 18 to adversity in your family puts you at twice the risk for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, all things that cause an unbelievable amounts of distress and cost for our country. And we think that there's this connection that people maybe didn't know about until this study. So that's what's important about the ACE study. Next slide, please. The other thing that's really important about the ACE study is that it really limits us to thinking about trauma only in 
families. It was looking at those things that happen within a family. What we have learned and what JC commented on in the intro is that trauma doesn't just occur in the course of a family. It actually can occur to communities and to whole populations. So when we start thinking about trauma, we've expanded from that original ACE conceptualization. You may hear people talk about ACEs, but we also now move beyond ACEs and there's urban ACEs and there's all kinds of atrocious historical events that have happened. So when we think about trauma now, we, we expand that lens beyond that individual child and family and think about what are the other types of trauma this kid might've been exposed to that have to do with their what they're exposed to in their community. Is there equitable opportunity? Do their parents have the opportunity to get jobs? What is their school like? What's happening around them? Are there adults that they can go to for support if they're dis distressed? And are the physical spaces even safe? So we started to understand a much broader context. Next slide, please. And then when we start thinking about trauma, we also expanded into that historical trauma. We start thinking about, it's not just what happens. So if you look at this little green line here um, where it says conception, those adverse childhood experiences are what happened to a child after they were born. But there's this whole awareness now that there are also social conditions and generational historical traumas that can happen and impact kids that actually set them up to be more likely to be impacted by trauma as they grow older. So we see this as it's the science of epigenetics. We're starting to understand that what happens in utero can impact your brain development, can impact your physical development, and can impact your likely outcomes. Next slide, please. So basically what I just wanna leave you with is this idea that we think of trauma as what happens in those leaves, those adverse childhood experiences that might be happening in a family or that could be impacting how kids experience those adults who are supposed to keep them safe. But we also wanna think about what's happening to that tree. That tree is in a root system where the collective historical experiences are in the dirt and in the ground and it's part of all of what we are growing out of. And then those roots are also part of all the other things that happen. So we just wanna be really clear when we're talking about trauma, we are talking about a very broad conceptualization. And as I mentioned before, that ACEs study has been repeated now in multiple settings with people across the world and we see the same exact pattern. I'm gonna hand it over to Karen to continue on the impact. Hi. Um, so <laughs> welcome. I'm sorry, I just got a little disoriented by the muting. Uh, the thing that I would like to sort of emphasize, Colleen has talked really nicely about some of the environmental impacts and the larger community issues, but trauma also affects brain development. And I think this is a really important concept for us to understand. If you look at this picture, you see a picture of a three-year-old child's brain, okay? On the left, the larger brain, that is essentially a normal brain at the 50th percentile for a three-year-old child. The brain on the right shows the brain development of a child who has experienced extreme neglect. What you notice, of course, is that the normal brain is much larger than the brain that has experienced neglect. And so you see the impact of poor nutrition, of, um, of not having enough input, particularly not having enough environmental input. In addition, you notice these darker spots in the center of the brain on the right-hand side that is an indication of defects in brain development that have to do with enlarged brain ventricles. And you'll also notice that in this brain, there are fewer neuronal connections. The point is that trauma profoundly impacts how our brains grow. Next slide, please. Now, many of you have probably heard of the fight, flight, or freeze response. And this is another aspect of the biology involved in stress responses. Um, this is something that's been hardwired into us as individuals. You see this cartoon down in the lower left-hand corner. When we were, you know, cavemen on the prairie and a saber-toothed tiger would come for us, we needed to be able to react quickly. And our brains are hardwired to respond to threat. In a normal process, what you see is that there's a perceived threat that a person experiences that leads to adrenaline and cortisol and other hormones pumping into you. you. You know this because when you get frightened, right, your heart pumps, you might feel yourself kind of stronger. This prepares you to run or freeze, whatever you need to do to protect yourself, right? But when that threat is over, your body returns to baseline and the hormone levels decrease. 
That's what happens in a normal process. However, next slide. For children who experience ongoing and chronic stress, which is what we're talking about for many of the children we're talking about, this process becomes disrupted. In a sense, it's too much of a good thing. So a process, a biological process that in fact is uh, adaptive in most instances becomes maladaptive. So you have a perceived threat, you have that pumping of adrenaline and cortisol to prepare for you to respond to the threat when you respond with fight or flight. But in the child who has chronic stress, that system never returns back to normal. And as a result of that, they're always on higher alert. There's always a kind of hypervigilance. They're always much more tense and reactive because their, their threat response has not returned to normal. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so there are impacts on the brain, but I also want to emphasize as we do that there is good news. There is plasticity in neurodevelopment, okay? First of all, not everyone exposed to adverse experiences is, is traumatized, right? Colleen mentioned that depending upon your developmental stage, depending upon other factors, you may or may not respond to a trauma. That's what the three E's are about, right? In addition, our brains have an amazing ability to learn, grow, and change in response to the environment. So with the proper environmental input, we can actually um, um, uh, mitigate the effects of trauma. In particular, brains can recover, and the most significant aspect in that recovery is the positive kinds of interactions that occur through social reinforcement and relationships. Okay, so the brain can be actively engaged in reshaping and relearning, but that requires positive input from the environment. And Carmen will talk a little bit more about those things later. Next slide, please. Okay, what are some of the common reactions that we see in children? So one of the first areas that we see problems for children who have been experienced to chronic tra trauma is in biological and physiological dysfunction, right? These children often have trouble regulating their body functions. You may see regression in eating or sleeping or toileting. This regression is particularly uh, common in young children, children under six. You might see lots of physical or somatic complaints, headaches, stomach aches. Next slide, please. We also see, and these are this is the part where schools probably uh, respond most, um, cognitive manifestations of complex trauma. So when you have a chronic stress reaction, when you have children exposed to trauma over and over again, what you have is a chronic sense of hyper alertness, fearfulness, la lack of ability to explore the environment. Often there are attachment relationships that are uh, that are dysfunctional because the trauma has occurred in the context of uh, abuse or neglect. Um, and so we also have the brain changes that we've described, right? Children's brains aren't as well developed. As a result, we see learning disabilities. We see memory problems in these children and attentional difficulties. One of the most common things we see, particularly in children between the ages of two and six is poor development of verbal skills. And we know that there is no more significant predictor, predictor of success in school than good verbal skills, okay? Perhaps even more importantly, we see that these children begin to in, internalize negative beliefs about themselves and about the world. They perceive the world as a dangerous place. They're less willing to explore. They're less willing to reach out in a trusting way to others. And as a result of all those uh, factors, there are secondary effects that, that uh, magnify the effects of trauma. Next slide, please. There are also lots of emotional manifestations. So as I explained to you, a lot of these kids are on high alert all the time, right? So what we see frequently is a lot of hypervigilance, a tendency to be explosive. These kids also often have been in relationships where they're, uh, the adults in their lives haven't taught them to co-regulate their emotions. The adults themselves haven't modeled good emotion regulation. Um, that coupled with this trauma response response. Could you go back, Jamie? Thank you. Uh, results in sadness, 
see irritability, you can see anxiety, lots of uh, poor awareness of their own emotions, inability to use feeling words, all the things that children need to learn to develop, particularly between the ages of two and five, to be able to emotionally regulate are things that th these children are unable to do. Um, for some of these kids, we also see an extreme fear of separation. They can be clingy, uh, they can be withdrawn. Next slide, please. Along with the emotional manifestations, we also see behavioral manifestations. So often these children come into our office as child psychologists because they are oppositional or they have poor impulse control or they've been aggressive. As you may recall, we talked about them being on high alert. Their brains are overreactive. Frequently, they misinterpret uh, actions of others. So something like an accident, somebody trips them accidentally, they might turn around and, and uh, react aggressively, okay? We also see lots of reenactment of trauma in play, in talk, and in behavior. Um, so these children become difficult for teachers and other adults to manage. And as a result, again, they get a lot of negativity from the environment. And so we get into this negative cycle. Next slide, please. In addition, um, and I think this is a really important aspect of trauma that often gets uh, overlooked, a lot of these children have strong sensory uh, reactions. So they're either over or under responsive to sound, touch, movement, and visual threat. And a lot of this is because they misinterpret these things or because they've, they've uh, learned that ambiguous sounds might be scary, um, sudden movements are scary, they have a history of having these experiences, and so they become extremely sensitive from a sensory perspective, also as a function of the kinds of brain and hormonal shifts that we described earlier, these things can be more problematic for them. Next slide, please. Um, all of these things together, and particularly the way that people then react to them in the world because of the way they're acting, can result in strong impacts on their identity and their sense of themselves. These children frequently have no sense of hope. They don't feel positively about themselves. They don't feel like they're lovable or know how to love. There's a lot of self-blame, especially younger children. They almost always blame themselves for the negative things that happen to them. They think they've done something wrong. They have very uh, strong, negative beliefs about themselves and poor, uh, comp poor sense of confidence and self-esteem. So all the things that, that we need to develop, particularly in young children, a sense of mastery, a sense of being in control, a sense of being able to relate to others, a sense of being able to feel loved and worthwhile are not developing as a function of chronic trauma. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to, um, Carmen, who's gonna tell us that there is in fact lots of hope for these kids. And that's what we're all about is, is uh, changing these environments so these kids can feel better about themselves. Carmen? Thank you, Karen. So what are the strategies? How do you design places and spaces for children that are trauma informed? And let's go ahead and get it right at it. Next slide, please. So here's what we're asking. Here's our guiding star. This is the question that we wanna ask. Shifting our perspective includes asking a different question. So instead of what's wrong with this child, we really wanna be thinking about what has this child been through. Next slide, please. So let's start by looking at the components of trauma-informed care. And, and there is some debate about the number of critical factors to helping children who have experienced trauma. So the, what you see here are the most common. So creating a safe environment, building relationships and connectedness, and supporting and teaching emotion regulation. So we call this our hamburger slide. And I'll talk about the middle part of the slide of the hamburger in more detail in a moment. And we also have the buns of the hamburger. So the part that holds all of this together are culture and equity and self-care. The need to assess and act on ways to achieve racial equity in everything that we do um, and the importance of taking care of ourselves are critical pieces to all of this. Next slide, please. So being trauma-informed is all about shifting your perspective, and you can click that for me, Jamie. So we're asking ourselves to go from a traditional perspective to a trauma-informed perspective and learning ways how to respond appropriately to all children. 
but specifically those who have been exposed to trauma. Next slide, please. So to shift our perspective, what do you give up and what do you gain? So we're asking and we're looking at challenging behaviors, not as the result of an individual deficit, but possibly as a way of coping with traumatic experience. The traditional perspective, keep going, Jamie. Um, in the traditional perspective, we think of behaviors as difficult, as personal and purposeful, and not in the trauma-informed perspective asks us to look at behaviors as maybe an automatic response to stress. We're not focusing on changing the individual child to fix the problem, rather focusing on the ways we can change the environment. We're not thinking anymore that adults need to uphold authority and control with children and families, rather our perspective shifts to a trauma-informed one, which asks us to offer flexibility and choice to children and families. And the last traditional perspective is that punitive discipline works, but when we shift our perspective to trauma-informed, we know that positive reinforcement works. And the last thing I'll say, one more click, is that support, the traditional way of thinking is if a child has been exposed to trauma, we need to send them to the social worker or the psychologist. But what we know is that support for children exposed to trauma is a responsibility of all adults and all staff and, and people in our programs and in our buildings. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? What are the mechanisms to creating trauma-informed spaces? And so you see them here. Now this is the middle of the hamburger slide that I mentioned a few minutes ago, along with the bottom bun of self-care. So first is creating a safe envi environment, including activities being structured and predictable, being emotionally safe, offering consistent routines, using visual calendars and schedules, things like providing clear expectations and consequences when needed and making sure to allow the kids to be part of the development of the rules while also thinking about avoiding discipline practices that mirror or replicate any prior traumatic exposure and experiences. Creating a safe space for kids to calm themselves when they need to do so. Including in that is, is psychological safety. We understand that if a child's basic needs aren't met, it can be really difficult for them to focus and learn. We think about things like behavioral safety, how to celebrate successes and, and positive reinforcement. When we are talking about building relationships and connectedness, it includes things like reflective listening. So using eye contact and head nodding and encouraging the child to tell you more, not in a demanding sort of assertive tell me more type of way, but in a, you know, go on or, or I get that or I understand what you're saying sort of way and helping children understand and label their feelings. One thing I'll say here is it's important to understand that there are many types of trauma, Colleen mentioned this earlier, but we want to think about the, the historic and present day manifestations of, of racism and inequity. And so helping children exposed to trauma requires self-awareness about those aspects of trauma as well. And so supporting and teaching emotion regulation, teaching feelings identification and modeling appropriate and healthy ways to manage big feelings. Um, teaching them progressive muscle relaxation so that they learn to calm their bodies and be ready to learn. Last but certainly not least is provider self-care. I'm imagining that many of you may have heard of the analogy of putting the oxygen mask on yourself first um, before you put it on someone else. And this is a critically important piece. Self-care is an active process. It's really important and a critical component to preventing, to preventing burnout. So it can help you think more clear, clearly and make better in the moment decisions and infusing a trauma-informed framework into your daily routine with kids. Next slide, please. So all of these strategies, everything that we have shared with you today has this goal in mind, helping kids repack their invisible backpack. And as you heard from Karen, trauma impacts children in several key areas of functioning, including their self-concept, their beliefs about the extent to which adults are safe or not, the, um, their beliefs about their safety in the world. And so how can we repack this backpack with new experiences, with creating safe spaces, with teaching relationships and connectedness needed to make them feel safe, loved, and valued in the world? Next slide, please. So how do we promote resilience? And we talked about resilience in the, in the beginning, you heard a little bit from it about Karen. Uh, you heard Karen talk about it as well. And we're going to round it out by saying this is critical pieces to promote resilience throughout the lifespan. 
It's never too late to, to build and foster resilience in children, even, even children who have been exposed to trauma. Um, how to look at the places and spaces where to do that, homes, schools, community organizations, and, and arts programs and the like. Every community, every child, every family, across all of those key domains that you see listed here. Next slide, please. So with that, that's the end of my time. I wanna thank everybody for their attention. And I think we're gonna to toss it back to Jamie now or, or maybe JC to get our, our Q&A started. All right, thank you to, uh, to all of our panelists. That was uh, really, really great stuff and great grounding. Um, so I will move us through some questions now. Um, we got a couple questions that came in from attendees that I'd like to start with. Um, and Karen, my hunch is that these two are, are one good ones to start with you, but you all know <laughs> your work and probably collaborate quite a lot. So please do um, help one another out if I have directed the question wrong. The first one I think is kind of a definitional question. Um, someone is asking if complex trauma is the same as PTSD or complex PTSD. So um, a quick clarification on, on those terms there. Um, okay. so. Uh, you know, when we talk about complex trauma in young children, that often doesn't meet the formal diagnostic and statistical criteria that, that psychiatry uses for PTSD. Sometimes it does, but more often it does not. And that is because those definitions are largely based on adult reactions. So some of the results, I mean, some of the, the reactions we see in complex trauma certainly are similar to complex PTSD, so for example, things like hypervigilance, et cetera. But because we don't always have access to what children are thinking or what, they are, what their internal state is, it's sometimes harder for them to actually meet the definition for actual PTSD, but um, the, the reactions are very similar. Thank you. Um, and we'll stay with you for this question as well, Karen, if that's okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to read this one. Someone's asking, to what degree do you find that trauma in children can manifest in less classically recognizably aggressive ways, less acting out, maybe more folding inward or internalization? Um, this questioner is asking, uh, what are the ways to best help children who may not present in the most easily noticeable ways? Yeah, so, so extreme withdrawal is actually a, a not uncommon response to complex trauma. Um, unfortunately, this was a very quick rendition of trauma and we didn't get to cover everything. Uh, so I'm glad that this person asked this question. Uh, withdrawal is not uncommon. In fact, in the classroom, we often see children who have experienced trauma off in a corner, unwilling to engage. There's a kind of fearfulness that characterizes them frequently and also often a mistrust of adults. And so the re response needs to be to gradually and consistently show up and show up and show up and try and engage and try and engage and build relationships. So they're gonna take probably much more patience. It's a different kind of patience than the child who's acting out aggressively, but it, it may take a lot of effort to draw them out, to get them engaged. And that's gonna take building a relationship with them. I also just wanna to add Thank to you. that, that I think that those might be the kinds of kids for whom arts education is so incredibly critical because for many of those kids, verbal expression and being able to rely on adults to try to kind of help calm them down is just not working. And so again, that's part of why this partnership is so important is that we know what kids need and we know that they don't need it once a week in a therapy office with a mental health professional. They need lots of opportunities to practice and develop these skills and these muscles to cope. And many times these kids, because of their distrust of the world and adults in particular, it's gonna be more difficult. And so the more creative ways that you all work can be really powerful for helping to unlock their ability to process some of what they've been through or to just begin to communicate with others. Yeah, I really appreciate that addition, Colleen. And, and let me just say that part of that also is a lot of the sensory kinds of things that you, that you all do, and that those are really helpful with those children frequently. That's great, thank you all. Um, a question has come in in the chat. Um, Carmen, I think this is one that came from uh, one of your slides. Maybe you can start us off. Um, the questioner asks that, uh, says that 
there was a mention of consequences as important and necessary in the classroom, but consequences that wouldn't mirror or re-traumatize um, uh, child's past experiences. Um, so can you say a little bit more about what the more productive kind of consequences are? So when we think about a, a consequence that could re-traumatize a child, we're talking about like yelling. Um, we, and we really think about consequences in the, in the comfort and safety of relationships. And is it punitive discipline? Is it I'm going to I'm going to punish you because I'm very very pissed off at what you did and I'm activated, or is it uh, a learning experience for the child? Is it oh you know what I see you having big feelings right now and I, I heard you curse at that kid so I wonder uh, you're frustrated. Here are some ways that we can what we can do when we're feeling frustrated. It's about reframing and thinking about discipline as a way to encourage and support resilience and promote resilience in children and not punitive discipline, which is the traditional way of, I'm just pissed off, I'm reacting to what you did, and so I'm going to respond to you in this way. So I think the relationship piece is critical, and also figuring out how to, how to teach a replacement behavior. So you have this, you have big feelings, you, you're frustrated about this, and let's give you, let's help you label an emotion, let's help you reframe that, let's um, help you focus on something different, and, and teach you other ways to be and respond and more appropriately react. So we're just thinking about changing the frame from traditional discipline practices to reinforcing and reframing the positive behaviors and being role models in the moment when we're, when we're feeling frustrated is also a very a critical piece of teaching children how to behave because they get their cues from us. Um, can, I, can I just add something to, to what Carmen said? With older children, we talk a lot about restorative justice and people think about that concept as related to older children and teenagers, but we also can use the restorative justice approaches with younger children. And what a restorative justice approach does in the context of consequences is it gives children an opportunity to say what the, their understanding of what happened, talk about it, understand how it impacted others and make amends. And that is a growth enhancing experience instead of being a punitive experience. That's great, thank you all. Um, there's an interesting question that's come in about the development of the field. Um, how has childhood trauma grown over the last 50 years? Is it that we're now more aware of it or has it actually gotten worse? Um, Colleen, do you have a perspective to start off with that? Sure, um, I, I think, we have a lot more awareness. Um, the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition has been around for over 20 years and our primary goal when we started was to build awareness and to have adults um, recognize that this is something that is happening and that often results in kids being labeled as either needing psychiatric issues or diagnoses, ending up in welfare, child welfare where they might be being separated from their family or in the juvenile justice system. And so part of what the, the field was trying to do for a long time is to start to say that depending on what door somebody walks into, the same behavior can result in many different labels and many different outcomes. And part of what we need to get to is understanding that if we can look at what's happened to children and how their responses are really manifestations of them trying to cope with an unacceptable situation, but it worked for them in some way and we need to now help them unlearn that behavior. It's a real shift and helps us to avoid pathologizing. And also hopefully you heard in our words, the notion that it, it also means that there's something that we can do to help them grow and change and develop those different brain patterns and behavior patterns. So I think the field has done a couple of things. I think that broadening and that thinking about what that looks like is huge. I think a second thing as Karen pointed out is the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder um, came from army vets. They came from adults that young men mostly who were in war and horrible things happened. And then they came back to this country and manifested certain symptoms. And that diagnosis has been taken and applied to small children. And what we know is that small children are not little adults. Um, they're at different developmental spectrum and different experiences. And that trauma isn't always something that happened once and then goes away or happened far away, but rather that it's something that happened nearby and it's continuing to happen and they're in that environment. So that no post issue. So I think the field has grown um, in a number of different ways. One away from this sort of just diagnostic criteria that leads to a certain treatment and more towards a broader conceptualization of how trauma can impact young people and anyone. And then secondarily, I think to recognizing that the, the PTSD diagnosis is somewhat limited. There's debate in the field as to what we should be doing. And, and early childhood is actually a place that they've 
built in some different criteria and symptoms to try to understand that. So I think the field is growing. I think what we would like to see um, as a center is more adults that work with kids across settings, not just mental health, being exposed to all of this content and getting this training pre-service. So when they're in their education schools and social work schools and medical schools, rather than when they're out in the field um, working. And so we certainly, um, we're happy to do professional development, but we really love to see that investment in getting these skills taught to those adults as they're emerging into their professions and fields. So those are some thoughts. That's great, thank you. Um, and maybe you can start us off with this next question to Colleen. Um, we're having this conversation in the context. We're all locked in little Zoom boxes and we have been <laughs> living this strange reality for quite a while. And it looks like it will be with us for, for at least months into the future. Um, so I know we're not out of this current moment that, that, that we're, we're living through, but I'm wondering um, what sorts of things are you thinking about in terms of the impacts of COVID-19 and all of the disruptions on, on our life and how children learn and how children experience um, uh, the receipt of services, those sorts of things. Like, what, what are you thinking about as we start to move into what comes next about what this might do um, to, to the system? Yeah, that's a really great question. And again, we don't have the answers, so we're really making guesses. Um, but I think from uh, the standpoint of our team, certainly there's a lot that happens in school beyond academics. And we've created a model to try to deliver academics um, in a crisis. And during a crisis, you come up with creative solutions, and this is the one we've got, virtual learning. But I think we would all agree that it's not the best place to learn social emotional skills. And so as kids emerge from this time, I think we're going to have to be really careful that we don't get so preoccupied by our um, cognitive deficits or concerns that kids have fallen behind. We know that's possible and we know that happens during the summer that kids who've been out of school lose some of their learning, but it's a cohort effect. They're all going to be in that space together. Some unfortunately have had lots of reinforced, you know, lots of access to services to make up for that. Others haven't, but in general, the one that's really consistent for many of us is going to be that social skills and that social processing. And so I think realizing that for many kids, this has been difficult. But for some kids, it's been pretty fantastic. They're not getting bullied. They're not outside of their family's home. They're with the people that they love the most. So they're not growing into new experiences. So I think having that openness, and I think certainly for you all as arts educators, making sure that people don't get so caught up in, we have to read, make sure they know their math at the level they're supposed to and they're reading, but that they really do need these other opportunities to learn how to trust one another and to have those emotional connections and those social emotional skills will be critical. And I think it's up to folks like all of us to make sure that that happens. Otherwise, I think we could have some long-term impact in terms of kids' social emotional functioning. We're seeing and hearing about more anxiety and more depression from all parents across socioeconomic levels. And so we know kids are struggling and the longer this goes on, and especially when their adults are, you know, are also struggling with these things, um, the harder it's going to be for us to help kind of move towards healing. So we certainly are, we have ideas about how we can address some of that now, but that's certainly important. I wanted to add that, you know, Colleen noted the difference in, in sort of access to resources for a lot of children. For some of the children that we're going to be addressing when they return to school, they've been exposed to even more trauma as a function of, the, a function of this. There's been food insufficiency in large numbers for lots of families. We've seen unemployment shifts. We, we've probably seen increases in adult substance use as a function of this. And all that is going to have an impact on the kinds of complex trauma that kids experience in their homes where it's most problematic for them. And so for some of these kids, school was kind of a safety net and a place where they could escape and get positive adult reinforcement and feel better about themselves. And so for those kids, I think even more repair work is going to be needed. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect example of how we're going to need to probably push for universal um, strategies that are going to help all kids kind of reconnect with one another and reconnect with their teachers and, and reestablish normal routines but also that we're gonna need the adults that are interacting with kids as they re-enter school um, to be trained to look for some of those signs and symptoms that things that a kid might need more. And again, we take a resilience lens. So we believe that if we identify that soon and start you know, 
addressing that and giving kids the skills that they might need to make up for some of that, we should see positive outcomes. But if we fail to do that, and we just jump right into academics and we ignore all these social emotional learning um, challenges, I think we, the impact will be much worse for our city and our culture. Thank you so much. Um, so there's a question that is uh, that next that's um, really important to the context of many of the arts educators who are maybe listening in now. Um, very often people are working in as, as a teaching artist are with young people only once a week for a period of weeks or for a few short a few short weeks. So a questioner asked, um, uh, is there too short a time to build a relationship? Carmen, you talked about the importance of uh, relationship as the context of all of this reframing and thinking about discipline. Um, so given that teaching artists often have to build relationships uh, in very different time frames than school-based educators. Do you have any thoughts on how how that might play out for those uh, those workers? So yeah, I think that it is it is never too late to start building relationships and fostering resilience in kids. And I think that you have to look at your sphere of influence and the place and space that you can do it. So if you can, if you are an adult listening and you are in a space, if you can listen and comfort. If you can be a safe, consistent person, even if it's for 20 minutes, for however, however much time you have with the child, it's never too late. And there's always enough time if you think about your sphere of influence and what access points you have. And if it's just one class period, one time a week, then if you can listen and comfort, if you can be consistent and nurturing, if you can bring your best self to the space, then um, you can develop relationships with foster resilience in children in those, in those moments. And I would add that I think kids are really good at knowing if you are in the space and fully present with them. And so whatever time that you have that you're fully present and let them know that you really are there to pack their, repack their backpack, that you think that they're important and their ideas and their, what they've been through and what they're doing and, and how they're feeling is critical. They will remember that. Um, and, you know, there's that quote that says, people won't always remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I'm gonna guess many of you in those moments that you're there, probably bring joy and uh, reflection back to kids on how their experience is being validated by an adult that other adults don't do. And that might have much more time with them. So it's not a dose effect. Um, when we talk about safe, stable, nurturing relationships that the, you know, have been identified as critical for kids development, it's not just one person in that role, it's actually the village. So this is a place where, you know, it takes a village. I know it gets overused, but it's true. Um, if a kid's having a really bad day with their teacher and they're in a negative spiral and things just aren't going well and you show up and let that kid know that you see them and hear them and enjoy their presence for 25 minutes, that could be the relief that that kid needs to keep going that day and be in that classroom and be effective and not get himself suspended because he's really not happy being in that class anymore. So. It, it's important to keep that in mind too. And let me just add that the people who do this, as we said previously, have access to a kind of expressiveness in children that teachers often don't have room for in the regular classroom. And many, many of these children who are struggling, as we said, with cognitive limitations or uh, problems with you know behavior because they're struggling with ADHD or attention issues or some of the things that are a result of trauma, they can find a space in an art room or a music room to express themselves where they don't feel judged, where they don't feel as much like they have to produce something they don't feel good at. And it's a real opportunity, I think, for those particular adults in their lives to connect with them. That's great. And there's, um... More questions than we'll have time to answer, um, for which I feel bad. Um, maybe Jamie and I can try to, to track some of these questions and, and, and connect some resources afterwards because there was a question about training and resource. I would suggest checking out um, the CCR's website as, uh, as, as a good place to, to, to go for some clearinghouse. Moving into a wrap-up question, um, maybe uh, for each panelist, what is one piece of advice for a teaching artist or a teacher um, just getting started that they can think about on a journey of becoming more trauma-informed as they think about the, the environment that they build? So I, from my perspective, I would say if you, if you can work on good reflective listening skills, that's a real critical gift that you can give kids. So I would start with that. 
I'll go next. I think that um, the value and importance of relationships and also assessing and acknowledging and acting on and being aware of your own implicit bias and, and achieving racial equity with all children in all spaces and, and understanding, recognizing what biases and conscious and unconscious you're bringing to the space and figuring out the place and space that you can correct for that. So that would be my, my bit of advice. And I would build right off of that with adult social emotional learning um, in order to be present and be there and be a, you know able to be that vesicle that can help hold kids' feelings and intense emotions and challenges the more you sort of have the capacity yourself. So be um, gentle with yourself. Give yourself time to make transitions. I know you run around from school to school and do lots of different things, but as you're walking through that door, taking that second to take three seconds and do a little emotional check and go in and just be fully present, um, but really working on your own skills as well as um, as just enjoying kids. Because as you know, most of us who work in, with kids know they're funny and they're fun. And if you're not finding them funny and fun, you, you gotta do some self checking. So enjoy them and bring your energy to them and, and they will respond in kind. What a great note to end on. Thank you so much. As we, we move into a wrap up space, a um, um, couple of things are sitting with me now. One is the idea that it is the responsibility of all grownups who intersect with a child over the course of their day or their time. Um, it is all of our responsibility um, to help foster resilience um, and, and become more trauma informed. Carmen, I'm thinking a lot about the hamburger slide and about um, the bonds of uh, of racial and cultural equity um, and self-care, uh, really holding it all together. Um, it's not just about those things being important. It's a, you know, if, if we're not aware of the biases we bring in space as adults, then we're not gonna be able to reflect them. And if we're not able to take time and space for ourselves and manage ourselves, we're not gonna be able to do that for, for, for young people. So it's not just um, feel good. It really is tied into to the work of, uh, of, of how we show up best for kids. Um, I heard, um, genuine listening and honest presence uh, is, is deeply important. So thank you all um, for your amazing remarks and even more than that for, for your important work uh, in Chicago and nationally. You're all remarkable leaders in this and it's been a privilege to, to learn from and, from and with you on this journey. Thank you for, for your time today. Thank you to our attendees. Um, thank you to Illinois Humanities for the amazing support to help make this happen. There will be a recording of this um, available in the coming weeks. I believe you can check the Chicago Children's Theater website. Um, and then Jamie will be posting into the chat um, registration link for next week's panel, which is going to be next Wednesday at this time, which is multidisciplinary arts education approaches to trauma. Um, so I believe I have hit all of my marks on that. And we're at 431. So I apologize for holding up a minute late. Jamie, did I miss anything? Are we good? All right. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, that we're all set. So thank you all for attending. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all supporters. Thank you all very much for your work out here. Please stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thanks so much.